celebrate the 4th of July, we need to be aware of the significance and the implications from a historical standpoint of what it means for our people, people of African ascent. In a book published by Ishak Kamusa Barashango entitled African People and European Holidays, A Mental Genocide, he talks about the history of the American Revolution, of the British colonies, of their cultural uh, predations, and the involvement with slavery and makes it clear that it is not a holiday that our people should celebrate. He even talks about how blacks were used in the sur in the war, both by the British and the uh, rebellion leaders, and they were promised freedom if they fought on behalf of the British by the British, and they were promised freedom if they fought on the ha on behalf of the rebellion by those who were running the American Revolution. In both cases, the British and the Americans reneged. Now, the British did take some of their supporters with them when they went to Nova Scotia, or some of them went back to the islands. But for the most part, the blacks who fought on behalf of the Europeans and the colonists were not rewarded. And in many cases, they weren't even compensated. So most of us have been brainwashed. Most of us have been lied to. Most of us have been given a false narrative of what really happened. And today we're going to share just some of the lies and help to right the wrongs of history because as one philosopher said, those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to relive them. And we certainly can't afford to relive the history that has happened to us in this country. Most of what we know about the American Revolution has been told to us by the agents of the ruling class, meaning those people who were educators who were taught a certain uh, cur curriculum, were taught a certain view of the world, and that world was beneficial to the ruling class. That, that world view is what will make us do things on behalf of the ruling class and not of ourselves. And so the, the truth is that the American Revolution was not a uni fought for universal freedom. Obviously, once the revolution was over and the colonists won and, and had their own country, they did not recognize the Native Americans. They did not recognize Africans. They did not recognize poor whites and certainly didn't recognize females of any gender or any class or any ethnicity. The American Revolution was promulgated by many people who were wealthy. They were the one percenters of their time and of that era. Many of them were slaveholders. Many of them profited off the slave uh, trade, particularly those from uh, New England and, and the South. Many of them were uh, holders of positions within the colonial, various colonial administrations, either some, someone like George Washington was in the military, but there were other people who held offices in the various colonial governments. And so those people who waged the revolution did not do so for universal suffrage, universal freedom, or universal recognition or status and equality. That just wasn't part and parcel of their program. In fact, uh, John Jay, one of the persons who were involved in the crafting of the Constitution, said that those who owned the country should rule it. And he later became a Supreme Court justice and ultimately became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. You also have to realize that the 
constitutional convention was a form of rebellion against the people. The people sent them there. The original purpose was to revise the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation were a loose band of regulations, laws, and procedures that bound the colon, the 13 colonies together, but they did not really have a strong centralized government. And there were issues with mail. There were issues with inter and intra uh, state commerce, trading, tariffs, uh, tolls, things like that. So they wanted to resolve those issues. The people who came to Philadelphia came with another agenda. They came with an agenda to undermine the will of the people who sent them to the convention and they came with the intent and purpose of creating a government at which they would be the principal uh, beneficiaries of the government. They would be the rulers, they would be the one percent, they would be the aristocracy of this new government. They just chose not to have a monarch, even though they wanted to make George Washington a king, and he agreed not to uh, go that route. He determined not to go that route. And so they came up with a constitution. The constitution was ratified. And most of us don't even know that the constitution contains elements that codify slavery and basically um, make slavery beneficial to the ruling class, the ruling elites of that day. And the first, they don't mention slavery because they were very cunning and they didn't want to uh, undermine their narrative that this was for justice, freedom, and equality. And they didn't want the world to know that they were slave holders, slave owners, and engaged in uh, the transatlantic slave trade. So they very cunningly and surreptitiously wrote and used other language to disguise what their real intents and pur purposes and motives were. For example, in Article 1, Section 2, there there's a clause. Now, most of us talk about the three-fifths clause, and we think that, okay, this, we've been taught and, and miseducated that this a clause a relegated black people to three-fifths of a person. That's not true. What it did was to count blacks in the total population, but only ascribe them three-fifths uh, of a person's for statute for purposes of representation for Congress and the Senate. And it reads thusly, representatives and direct taxes shall be appointed, shall be apportioned among the several states which may be in Included within the, this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding the whole number of free persons. When they're talking about free persons, they're basically talking about white males. And including those bound in service for a term of years. So they're talking about free people, but they're also talking about the indentured servants or the white slaves that were still here even after the revolution. And excluding Indians, not tax, three-fifths of all other persons. Now, they're not going to say three-fifths of the Africans, the blacks, the Negroes, or whatever. They said all other purpose, so they, persons. So they don't even identify the ethnicity of anyone else. The only ethnicity that they identify it are the Native Americans who they call Indians. So that the government itself, the censuses and the and the apportionment for representation included our people, but they did not include them as one person. They, on the aggregate, they took them and then looked at it from a three fifths perspective, as opposed to a one person, one vote type thing. Uh, because obviously they were setting up a very privileged and restrictive type of government. 
Section 9, the migration and importation of such persons. Again, they don't say Africans. They don't say black people. They say of such persons as many of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, meaning they could not do anything about slavery, about the slave trade for 20 some years. But a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. So they don't say each slave, they don't say each black person, they don't say each male, female, they say each person. And so the, the federal government itself, based on this constitution, got money up to $10 a head for our ancestors, the blacks that were brought here. And what they did, they were determined that they were going to move down this road, so they prohibited debate or any change to this for at least 20 some years. So we need to understand that and understand and understand and grasp the significance of this for ourselves. In Article 4, Section 2, it starts off by saying the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states, meaning that if you have a right or immunity in one state, you have it in, in, in each state. Now, going down to the third paragraph, it says no person held in service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequences of any law or Regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. In other words, the, the Fugitive Slave uh, Act is really in, included and embedded in the Constitution. Now, they use two words, held in service, so they're talking about indentured servants. Those are the white slaves. And they were slaves. They dogged them out just as badly and in some cases worse than they did the Africans because for production purposes and value of, of labor, African people were valued more so than the whites because we came with skills. We came, uh, we could do the work, whereas a lot of the whites just physically just couldn't do the work. And of course they talk about labor that those are the people they're referring to. They're our African ancestors. So all of this is included in their own constitution. It's just that it's done through subterfuge, and they, they did it in such a way that uh, they could cover up their crimes against humanity. The other thing is that we've been brainwashed, taught that the United States government is unique. Um, representative government was, is a novel idea, an innovative idea, and it was basically taken to the highest level by the Europeans who later became the Euro, Euro Americans who later became the Americans. That's not true. They, meaning the Euro Americans or the early colonists, learned about representative government from the Native Americans. The ones living in the middle states, the mid Atlantic states, and some parts of New England had contact with the Native Americans, particularly the Iroquois. And Ben Franklin and several other of his contemporaries met as early as 1744 on one occasion. And in fact, Ben Franklin even talks about it. And this is the fact. Uh, the Onondaga base south of, uh, Buffalo, with the area now of Buffalo are one of six nations that now make up the Confederation, which stretches from the Mohawks near Al Albany to the Senecas near Buffalo. Before Europeans settled upstate in the 1600s, the five nations of the Iroquois lived under a constitution that had three main principles. Peace, equity or justice, and the power of the good minds, that of the elders over the young, uh, Professor Lyon said. And 
you know, according to Europeans, I mean, from a European perspective, a Euro, Eurocentric perspective, that's an alien way of life. And you can find out more information just by looking up uh, Iroquois constitution or Native American governance or Native American influence on American form of government. government. The Native Americans, Africans, most people of color, most Aboriginal people, most indigenous people had representative forms of government. Even those had, who had sophisticated systems of where you had a chief or a king or a hereditary king, there was always the element of balance in the government. The king, the chief could not be a despot. But in a more rudimentary uh culture, society, tribe, village, you might have the elders and you would have meetings and the the members could bring their concerns and they'd be talked over and they would make decisions based on consensus as opposed to uh ballot box elections, uh, you know, where we've been brainwashed to believe that that's the best and greatest form of governance ever. It's not true. So before you, you go out and celebrate the 4th of, July, 4th of July, as some people call it, learn the facts, learn the truth. The truth will make you free. And also, we have to look at the situation today. We're dealing with massive hypocrisy, massive uh, mendacity as the American empire replicates the British empire to the point that uh, at one point, the British said the sun never sets on the British Empire. Well, now the Americans say that they're a global force for good, to quote one of their brainwash and mind control commercials. And they have over 100 bases in almost 100 countries. And these are just the known ones. We're not talking about the so-called black sites. We're not talking about the covert ops bases of the CIA and some of the other special elite forces, so-called elite forces, that are engaged in covert operations all around the world. So before you go waving a flag and talking about freedom, justice, and the American way, take a real look at what the American way means for you and our ancestors. And the sad reality is the very thing that they've dogged us out, and just like they dogged out the indentured servants and do some research on that because that's another form of hidden history that they don't want uh, people to know about. They talk about, they, they use the euphemism indentured servant, but they were really slaves. They dogged them out just as bad as they did the Native Americans and so, some, some of our ancestors, although from a standpoint of getting the most out of the person, Africans were viewed as more valuable because they could get more out of us because we brought more to the table, particularly when you look at indent white indentured servitude in, in the Caribbean. They worked most of them to death. Most of them, 60% of those people never lived out their term. They died before they reached the seventh year or 14th year or whatever the, the term of so-called indenture was. They just worked them to death. Yes, they did that here too, to us, particularly after uh, the uh, rise of, of, of cotton and the, the expansion of the South. But the early form of indentured servitude, they just dogged the white people out. And that's why many of those folks who are the descendants of those people have a negative view of the government. They want to be left alone. A lot of people from App Appalachia and, and places like that, whose history goes back to that time. And even some of the subsequent uh, immigrants that came here, like the Irish and the Germans who came in the, the 1800s, because they faced a lot of trauma, a lot of drama, a lot of uh, problems when they came here. So the narrative about America being this great place is just not true. And we need to be aware of that. And that's not to say that we have a defeatist attitude we have an attitude that our ancestors had to make it better and to 
improve ourselves and move ourselves to a, a state of empowerment, not so much to be a part and parcel of this government, because the government is, is totally corrupt for the most part, uh, but to establish values that could mean a better way of life and a better way of living and interacting with each other. So that's food for thought as we approach this holiday, so-called holiday. Stay strong.